Father, we thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. Above all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his precious blood. Thank you for your holy written word and for the mighty Holy Spirit who leads and guides us into the truth and who brings to our remembrance the things that Jesus said. Lord, we deposit this meeting into your charge for safekeeping. We thank you in advance for anointing every ear, mind, heart, and soul to receive the engrafted word. And for all that shall be said, wrought, revealed, and manifested, we will give you and you alone all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Father, we welcome and invite the supernatural of God to be in manifestation in this service, even as the Spirit wills. And finally, Lord, anoint this vessel of clay to minister life to your people, boldly without fear, favor, or respect of persons, that your word may proceed as it does from your own mouth. It will not return to you void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereunto it is sent. We believe that we receive these petitions of you because we have asked them in that mighty matchless and majestic name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, and everybody said amen. Glory to God. Well, you know, praise the Lord, slap a high five. That's, a, that's an act of faith there, glory to God. That's what we do in our in-person services. So slap a high five with three or four people, whoever you're nearby, and tell them, get ready. The word is going to do something in your life today. Something good is going to happen in your life today. Listen, let's turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Now, <clears throat> last segment, I believe I'd left off. We were looking at the book of James, and we'll get back there. But I want to give just a little bit of a refresher here on what, it, what meaneth this title, the hidden conflict, okay? The hidden conflict. And of course, we've been talking about also the weapons of our warfare. Now we'll get more specific into what I call that spiritual ordinance. Ordinance is sort of a military term that talks about weaponry and that kind of thing. But you know what? We do have a conflict going on. And I know it's quite evident as you look around in the natural and what's going on, not only in our own country, but even around the world. These are not things happening that have caught God off guard. These are not things that are happening that have taken God by surprise. Because you see, Jesus during his earthly ministry absolutely spoke of the times in which we're living. The apostle Paul reveals the times in which we are living and possibly provides tremendous granular detail about not only these times, but our equipping by the Holy Spirit, our equipping from the kingdom of God. The prophets of old, if you go back in the Old Testament and you read through the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and uh, Nehemiah and all the rest of them, there are many, many insights and many, many references to the times in which we're living. I remind you that Jesus himself said during his earthly ministry, he said, now, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, look, those same conditions, similar conditions, I should say, are going to be in manifestation in his, in his return. And so Jesus, his return or his coming back again, he said, you, you won't know the day or the hour, but he said, you certainly will know the signs of the times because they'll be there. And uh, I have told you several times that, we are now, I believe, in that place that Jesus identified as the beginning of sorrows. Now, you know, I know nobody necessarily wants to hear bad news or negativity or anything like that. That's why often when I back reference to the book of St. John, chapter 16 and verse 33, where Jesus said that, you know, in the world you will have tribulation. Amen. In me, he said, you'll have joy, but in, in the world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Now, when he said in the world, you have tribulation, I mean, he, he's covering the whole deal, all right? Whatever that is, whatever that looks like, whatever that feels like, whatever that sounds like, he says, look, in the world, this is what comes with the territory. But he said, you can have this one confidence and you need to hold fast to this. You need to hold fast to this. He said, be of good cheer. Keep a good attitude. Be positive. Make up your mind, you know, no matter what. I love what the psalmist David said. This is the day that the Lord has made. And then what did he say? He said, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Ha! This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, David probably did not necessarily know what the day held. We get up every morning, right? 
And we don't necessarily know what this day is holding, but you know what? We know who's holding us. Hmm. <laughs> Somebody said, what's that old song? He's got the whole world in his hands, right? He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. So we know who's holding us. And I always, I love to say every day, Lord, I thank you for protecting, preserving, sustaining, and keeping me and upholding me with the right hand of your righteousness. After that gets settled, my brothers and sisters, whatever else is really secondary and incidental. See, that's the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his word, according to his will, that we know that he hears us. And therefore, we know that we have the petitions which we have desired of him because you can always have confidence in God. He'll never let you down. Praise God. So let's deal with this invisible conflict. I'm taking you back to the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter specifically. In verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, we can park there for a good while. Be strong in the Lord, not in your own strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of God's ability to get things done. Let me read that from the Amplified Translation. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with him. Draw your strength from him, that strength which his boundless might provides. Glory be to God. You know, I I think I was watching some sort of an article, or yeah, I say watch an article, you typically read one, but now their video and all that. And someone was just talking about or asking where do people draw the strength from after they face tragic circumstances or challenges in their life? I mean, very severe things like that. And yet they seem to have their equilibrium. In other words, you know, they've they're still got their feet on the ground, their head held up high, and, you know, they seem to be ready to move forward in life, rebounding, if you would please, from a very uh, bad set of circumstances. And th many testify the fact that if it was not for the Lord, or you'll, you'll hear about some people that have notoriety and fame who say, it is my faith in God that sustains me through these issues and through these challenges. And I want to tell you something. You can't exactly see it, but you know it's real. You know it's real. It's like in Isaiah 26.3. Now, a lot of people out here kind of, they're losing it. All right? I mean, they're losing it. They're losing their minds. They're losing their peace. They're losing their joy. They're losing all kinds of things. And the good news is they don't have to. They don't have to lose any of that. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, Now he keeps him, that is in reference to God, God keeps him at perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Now I'm changing the pronouns because I want to make it relevant to you so you can grasp the concept and the principle that that verse reveals. He keeps let me make it plain. He keeps you at perfect peace when your mind is stayed on him. Get your mind focused on the Lord. You know, the Bible teaches a lot about what I call biblical thinking therapy. Yeah, there you go. Biblical thinking therapy, okay? Or thinking therapy from the Bible. Paul talks about it. In uh, the book of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, talks about the things that you ought to think on. Why? Because those things minister to your solical realm, the realm where you think and reason, the realm where you choose and decide, the realm in you where you express. That's your emotions. Amen? And so the Bible is full of that. Plus, of course, John and Jesus both came preaching that word when they said repent. A lot of people get upset with the word repent, but it actually simply means change your mind, change your thinking, realign your thinking. Don't think the way the world thinks. Think the way God thinks. Think the way the Holy Spirit impresses you to think. And I tell you what, that def all of that will contribute to that perfect peace spoken of in the book of Isaiah. Okay, back to Ephesians 6. So, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might or God's ability to get things done. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Now, I want to skip down verse 12 here. Look, because this is where the invisible conflict is literally revealed. He says, now, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Wow, that's powerful. Your fight and my fight 
is not with flesh and blood. Now, I know when you turn on your TV and look at the news, man, you see people out there rioting and carrying on and tearing up and vandalizing and beating up and shooting up. And wow, it's like the wild, wild west out there, isn't it? And yet the Bible says in the face of all that, it seems a paradoxical statement when it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And yet you look on that television screen and, and there's hundreds and thousands of people out there look like they're wrestling, shoving, pushing flesh and blood. That's what they're dealing with out there. Okay. But see, there's a hidden conflict behind that conflict. The conflict that you see with your natural eyes and you hear with your natural ears. And if you were out there on the street, you would be feeling in your natural body because of some object that was hurled at you or someone grabbed you or pushed you on the street or whatever. Uh, that You would consider that to be very, very real. But you see, there was a conflict behind that conflict. That's simply the outward manifestation of the invisible conflict. The conflict and the combatants are identified right here in this 12th verse. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but who are we wrestling against? But against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. And I noticed, I want to point out to you that in the scripture, it's the word against is right before the identification of the combatants, the enemy combatants. I want to read that to you from the Amplified too. For we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural sphere. Hmm. The heavenly supernatural sphere. So there's a conflict in what's identified as a heavenly supernatural sphere. It didn't say heaven itself. Heaven is another country. But it's not, it didn't say in heaven. There's no conflict in heaven. God's on the throne in heaven. There's no conflict going on up there. Nobody's hurling any objects. No one is using uh, profanity. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Nobody is rioting and looting and vandalizing in heaven. It's saying in the heavenly sphere, this is where this is going on. You and I live on this terra firma, on this earth, all right, the, the physical earth. But there is a cosmos, the world. That's the Greek word translated world, usually in your English Bible. In other words, there's a set of systems. There is a system that's functioning in this world and is being overseen by a spiritual renegade named Satan, all right? And all that started way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam committed high treason and went against the word of God. And as a result, all of this has befallen humanity. All of this. You, you don't realize how powerful beginnings are. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but also said that God breathed into man the breath of life and he became a living soul. And I think the last time we were together, I pointed out to you how far that breath has reached. He only breathed one time into one man. And here's all the rest of us. Praise God. Yeah, that's, a, that's a deep breath, wouldn't you say? Praise God. All right. So, there's the invisible conflict. I want to reveal that to you because as I've said before, uh, everything is spirit driven. Yes, listen, all of the arenas in which we deal within the framework of the kingdoms of men are all spirit driven. The arena of business, the arena of entertainment, the arena of education, the arena of political exchanges and transactions and so forth and so on. In other words, the entire scope of humanity and humanity's participation upon the face of this earth is all spirit driven. I want to remind you that there are three primary sources of spiritual input in this world. Three primary sources of spiritual input. God, us, because we are spirits, God is a spirit. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 4, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But see, we are also spirits, and we are as God. We're made in his image and after his likeness. We are speaking spirits. And so what we say 
also carries spiritual weight and spiritual impact, all right? And then you've got Satan himself, demonic forces, all right? These things identified here in Ephesians 6, 12. You know, the principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. So these are the three primary sources of spiritual input into this earth realm, all right? And believe it or not, isn't it interesting that we're sandwiched, in a sense, in between? You got God, us, and the devil, all right? And so we are the gatekeepers, if you will, or the guardians of our own souls. And you see, the transmission of spiritual input from any of these sources, we're, we're the gatekeepers. We can allow them to come in, we can allow those influences in, or we can actually resist them. Remember, here's a principle and a good, good point to bring up to you. We get it from actually James 4, 7, which says, now, ah, my goodness. Whatever you resist in life grows weaker in your life. Whatever, amen, whatever you resist in life grows weaker in your life. Whatever you submit to in life grows stronger in your life. That's why the Bible says, submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Did you get that? Amen. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Why? Because you want God's influence to be strong in you. That's why, you know, it, it all harmonizes, ladies and gentlemen. God's got this together. That's why he said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And when you submit yourselves therefore to God, you gain access to that limitless strength, that limitless impact and influence where you are strong in the Lord and in the power of God's ability to get things done. Amen? And, but he says, you resist the devil and he will flee from you. And the F5 translation has tags that with in terror. Amen? So there's a place you can get strong in the Lord. And uh, that strength of the Lord, when the enemy comes messing, <laughs> tries to mess with your blessing, then you know what? You bind him up in the name of Jesus and cast him out. You command him to cease and desist in his maneuvers against you, and he's got to go. He's got to go. Now, you know, you said, well, my goodness, I didn't know it was that easy. Well, I didn't write the Bible, but that's what the Bible says. Now, you may, you may render your own opinion on it, but I want to tell you something. It isn't opinionated. It states spiritual truth. It stays spiritual facts. Amen. In fact, I want to tell you something. The truth, listen, this is a strong statement. The truth of God's word can turn a natural fact into a lie. You know, it's a fact that if you drop a metal object in a swimming pool or in some water, it's going to sink down to the bottom. Do you know there's a place in the scripture where an ax head actually defied all of the natural laws that govern it and the water. And the ax head literally swam out of the water and jumped back on the ax handle from which it fell. Uh, to make a long story short, there was a gentleman that was cutting some trees. He was using the ax to help build a school for the prophets or whatever, and the ax head fell. And that was a tragedy, man, because that, that's what got the work done. And the prophet of God said, well, where did it fall? He said, right over there. And the next thing you know, man of God got involved and the ax head defied all natural laws. That's what I mean by the truth can change a natural fact into a lie. Because see, natural fact is metal sinks in water, typically. Uh, but in this case, it swam out of there. And so there, there's a lot of that in the Bible. There are a lot of things that, shall I say, where God gets involved and he can alter, change, and or suspend known natural laws. Hmm, how about that? So this is the kind of power that we're working with. And if you feel hopeless, if you feel helpless right now, if you feel challenged, if you feel like, man, nothing is really adding up, I'm going through this and that and the other, listen, draw on the limitless power and potential of God's strength and God's might and, and recognize that your battle is not with flesh and blood. Now, Let's, let's move on here. Praise the Lord. I want us to go to the book of James because as we look at the events that are going on around us, one might wonder, why is all this happening? Well, the Bible absolutely predicts with incredible accuracy the things that we are witnessing in the world today. 
Paul says in last days perilous times would come. This know also, amen, that in the last times or the latter days, uh, men shall become lovers of their own selves, and this is more lovers of pleasure than lovers of God. I'm, I'm just sort of, you know, condensing it. But these are the things that are happening. I mean, in real time, for years, I have been saying and talking about what I call God's prophetic timeline. Now, God has a timeline, a prophetic timeline of events. The prophets spoke of it. Jesus came along. He spoke of it. The Apostle Paul and his writings of the epistles of the New Testament, he speaks of it. The other writers speak of it. You've got James, the writer of the book of Hebrews. You've got Peter. You've got these guys writing, man, and they're telling you all of these things that are, shall I say, a sign somewhere on God's prophetic timeline. And see, regardless of what men's duties or activities do, God's timeline will be sustained. All right. God's going to do whatever it is he's going to do when he does it. And it doesn't matter what decrees come from the Supreme Court of our country or your country. It doesn't matter what the legislatures of our countries do or don't do. It doesn't matter what our presidents, prime ministers, monarchs, or anything else you've got as a po human potentate say or do. When God gets to a place on the prophetic, prophetic timetable that he wants to do something or say something, it's going to happen. You know, you ever, you ever watching TV, you're watching your favorite show, and then all of a sudden, there's an interruption in your, in your broadcast, your favorite show, and they say, well, we interrupt this broadcast to bring this important information, or they're going to preempt uh, what would be normally scheduled programming for an event that they feel in the news world or the media world is more important than that program you're watching. And it just, you know, that's the, that's the word. It preempts whatever it was you were watching, okay? And maybe by the time whatever this special programming is over, your program's over. You, you're sitting there saying, man, I hated to miss that episode, you know. Well, let me tell you something. God can come in and preempt anything at any time, at any place. The thing about it is God's impact is global, you know. It's global. Now, when Jesus came here, he came to one place, and that was Israel, what we call modern-day Israel. And he was there in Jerusalem and was all through the region of Judea. <clears throat> it's the only place on this earth that Jesus physically set his foot upon in his earthly ministry as, shall I say, the God-man, all God, all man, the Savior, the Messiah. Uh, it, scripture doesn't tell us that he visited Europe. Scripture doesn't tell us that he visited Africa. Scripture doesn't tell us that he visited the North American or South American regions. The scripture tells us he was born in Bethlehem, in the city of David. And they put him in a manger. They didn't put him in a hotel. They put him in a manger, all right? And yet he was the king of the Jews. He's the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Amen. And so we, we need to understand these things and understand, as I said, this prophetic timeline. And yes, there are some very significant and impactful events on that timeline. And see, when you have the Holy Spirit, among other things that Jesus said that he would do, lead us and guide us into the truth, but he said, listen, he would also show us things to come. So God's not going to shock us. God's not going to frighten us in that regard, all right? We have the Holy Spirit. We have the greater one on the inside of us who knows all of these things. Now, as he said, Jesus himself said, no man knoweth the day or the hour, but God knows it. And that's what helped me understand there is a prophetic timeline. We're watching signs of the times occur. We're watching events and things that are unprecedented, at least in our lifetime. But it doesn't mean they haven't been written about. It doesn't mean that they have not been revealed in the Scripture. Many of these things are revealed. Amen? And, uh, of course, the book of the Revelation is the great unveiler right there. A lot of people, unfortunately, even believers are, you know, afraid to read the book. They say, well, there's just too much going on in there. Big boulders are falling out of the sky and this and that and the other. And dragons are breathing fire and all kinds of things. This is burning up and that's burning up. And these four horse riders of the apocalypse, you know, one of them is, is death and another one is destruction and famine and all that. Oh, my goodness, I don't want to be around here. I don't want to saddle up that horse, right? Right. Well, you know, that, this is the culmination of all things. You have to understand that the world 
since the fall in the Garden of Eden has literally been accumulating iniquity and sin. It's been, it's been evolving and developing over all these generations. And, and we're coming to what's called the tipping point. Now, that's, that's the name of a real book, and it's a concept. But you know, you know what a tipping point is. It's, it's a place where, you know, it's the difference between something just sort of standing right at the brim, just at the cusp or just at the threshold of an event, and j- just one little tap can push it over. And, and that changes the entire scenario it, it dramatically. It, 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 it is the catalyst of, a, of another set of events, the tipping point. And we, as humanity, are moving toward the tipping point on God's prophetic timeline. The events that are still yet to come, the vials and the bowls and the sealed judgments that are spoken of in the book of the Revelation. You know, we could very possibly get into that a little bit further on or in other studies as God leads and directs us. But right now, we need to understand this invisible conflict so we can stop getting bent out of shape over the issues that people say or do to us, against us, or what have you, or the things you do and say toward or against others. You know, it's a two-way street out there. So, I mean, you may feel impressed, well, I need to do this or I need to say that, while others are also doing and saying back to you whatever it is they're doing and saying. And then, you know, that enemy's right there in the middle just egging everybody on. Yeah, just get into it. Just Let's just have a big old knockdown drag out. But again, I remind you, the conflict is invisible, but the forces behind it are what are driving the things that we see and that we hear. Now, James chapter 4. Here's an interesting perspective. I believe we left off here. From whence? Where? Where come wars and fightings among you? Do you see any of that going on out there? Do you see any fighting going on? You see any wars? You see any conflicts out there? Where do these things come from? This is the question, excuse me, that James asked. And he says, uh, come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Look, these folks want something. People out there in conflict and rioting, they're after something. Now, I admit some of them have no clue what they're after. If you were to take them apart and say, what, what is it you're fighting for? What is it that you want out of this situation? Well, they've got some catchphrases out there to use. You know, they've got a few mantras and a few this and that. It, well, I'm after this and I'm after that. You know, if you bore down a little bit further, they still may not even understand what it is they said to you. Some people are just trained to say some things because that's the going deal. You know, it's kind of like being captured in the military and they told you that if you ever got caught and captured as a POW, a prisoner of war, you just give them your name, your rank, and your serial number. There's a lot more to a soldier than his name, his rank, and his serial number. And the enemy usually knows that. They figure if they've caught an officer or somebody with some knowledge of the operation against them, they want to get that information. They want to extract that information out of them. And and many of these these, uh, individuals are not beyond torturing to get you to cough up the beans, you see. Uh, tell us where the, how many tro- what's your troop strength? Where are they coming from? What's the, what's the time of uh, engagement, this, that, and the other? But they tell you only give your name, your rank, and your serial number. And I'm going to tell you, if you fast forward up to today's times, that's pretty much what's going on out there. Some of these people don't know anything but their name, their rank, and their serial number. And they don't even really know what the mission is that they're on. See, listen, the Bible warns about strife and contention. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the Amplified Translation of James 4.1, it says this, What leads to strife, discord, and feuds? All right? And how do conflicts, quarrels, and fightings originate among you? Do they not arise from your sensual desires that are ever warring in your bodily members? You know, it's an interesting thing as I look at the current events these people say that are out here in this engaged in this civil strife, they say, well, you know, we want to burn this whole system down. We, we want to tear it apart. And I, you know, I guess the natural question I have to ask is, okay, after you've done that and you, you, you quote, unquote, take over, what are you going to have left to use to do what it is you want to do? 
You know, I mean, unless you're heading back to, I guess, what they call the Stone Age or some primitive times, what exactly are you going to do with that? See, this, this is amazing. As I said, the devil is not exactly a fool, but he makes fools, okay? He makes fools. And I'm just saying, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking about any particular individual or another. I'm still dealing from the perspective of what the Bible has to say about this invisible conflict. See, those spirits are involved. They, listen, people, when you open up your heart, you imbibe a spirit. You take in a spirit. You take in its influence. You take in its pressure. You take in all that it does to express itself. And you, you literally give place. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 4.27, neither give place to the devil. Don't give place to any unclean spirit. Don't give place to any evil spirit, any wicked spirit, any spirit of uh, divination or a spirit, a familiar spirit. There's all kinds of spirits on the, the, the downside, on the negative side, in the satanic realm, all right? Spirits of infirmity, spirits of deafness, spirits of blindness, all kinds of spirit, faction spirits, party spirits, oh my goodness. The list is endless. Sometimes I've even had to make up some names of some spirits based on the way I've seen them express themselves, all right? Spirit of anger, spirit of frustration, oh, spirit of fear. There's an identification for you right there straight out of the word of God. And Jesus himself identified a number of different spirits, demon spirits, unclean spirits that are designed simply to come in and afflict and affect humanity in whatever way they can. But I want to tell you, there are major things to get to influence you to really create a, a, a bad situation. That, that's what you got going on out there. Listen, let me tell you something. I don't care whose society you're in. When you go on somebody's private property and you destroy it, vandalize it, tear it up, set it on fire, uh, you're wrong, all right? That's wickedness. That's evil. You say, well, I, I'm justified in doing this because these folks didn't do for me what I thought they ought to, sh should have done for me, or they didn't give me what I thought I had coming to me. I, I, you keep on this path, and you may have something coming you don't want to arrive. Amen? So I want you to understand something. There is no, I'm talking from the Bible. I'm not talking from a political party. I'm not talking from any of that. I'm talking from the Bible, all right? There is no justification for sin. None. None. There is no justification. Now, you might do it. You might say it. You might think it. But there is no legitimate justification for it. Sadly, because of the curse of the fall, in this state of broken humanity, sadly, we may be subject to it or likely to it, yet we can resist it. Remember the principle of submission and resistance. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Do you always do it? No. Do I always do it? No. And there are those times where we stumble over a stumbling block where we make mistakes, where we mess up and we just downright do the wrong thing and say the wrong thing. And other people say the wrong things to us and do the wrong things to us. And yet, I want to tell you, there's absolutely no justification. Now, you'll come up with an explanation, but you won't end up with justification. You'll explain, well, you know, they, they didn't see it my way. It reminds me of that old Beatles song, uh, Try to See It My Way. There's a chance that I may be right and you may be wrong or whatever. I remember that. And, and he said, and there's a chance we might not be together for too long, or however the song goes. But, he said, but, but I like the little chorus line. I said, we can work it out. Mm. Well, that's what God says. He said, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I can make them as white as snow. <laughs> God says, we can work it out. Thank God for Jesus. We can work it out. And we need it to be worked out. And that's why God sent Jesus. Are you listening to me? To Because... What Jesus did on the cross was justification for us in spite of our state of affairs. That's a miracle. That's called grace. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me tell you something. You can be the sweetest, nicest person in the world. You may know somebody that that description may fit, but you know what? God says, you know what? as they are without him, their righteousness is as filthy rags before God. None of us can take our own righteousness, 
our own estimate of ourselves of being right or doing right or saying right and put it in the face of God and say, God, you got to accept this. No, oh, no, no. No, it's no good. It's no good. The only righteousness we have comes from God. God is the one that imputes righteousness to us. We, we can't make it on our own righteousness. You can't. You can't do enough good deeds. You can't say enough good words. You, you can't perform enough good gestures to be right in the sight of God. Otherwise, that'd be like, you know, being able to make yourself righteous. It, it's, there's no way that can happen. We, we had no, no chance of it. We, you, you understand? It is he that makes us righteous. It's the blood of Jesus that makes us righteous. It's his, it's his, ah, it's his death on the cross that justifies us. That's the only thing. God sees us through Jesus. Praise the Lord for that. Because if there wasn't a mediator between God and men, that being the man Christ Jesus, and God just looks directly at us, we have nothing to offer him. We have nothing that we can put in front of him and say, you know what? I have the right to gain access to heaven because I, I didn't cuss, I didn't fuss, I didn't steal, I didn't lie, I didn't cheat. But you see, the fact is, all, listen, all are under sin. Mm -hmm. All have sinned, the Bible said. All. There's no exception there. The only one that didn't was Jesus himself. Otherwise, everybody else sinned. That includes Daniel. That includes Joseph. That includes Mary, the mother of Jesus. That includes Joseph, who was considered to be Jesus' earthly father. Every other character in the Bible that you read about or that you've read about, they all sinned, came short of the glory of God and are all in need of salvation that can only come one way, and that is through the Savior, the Messiah himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's the way it is. You can't change the rules. God made them. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and all them that dwell therein. You can argue about you own this, you have this, you got this much stock in that, you're this, you're 60% ownership in this firm or in this company. Listen, it all belongs to God. Whatever you've got is on loan from God. Okay, you got the iron ore out of the earth, you found the diamonds, you found the platinum, you found the gold. But you know what? It was there before you found it. And you have to ask yourself this one question that will sober you for the rest of your natural life. Who put it there? <laughs> who, who put this here that I came along and found it, digging about a mile down here and going down in the ocean depths and finding this and that and the other? It was there before you got there. Amen. That, that, that's enough evidence right there that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all them that dwell therein because we are all his manufactured product, if you would, please. All right, let me move away from that. Let's get back to James 4 again here. All right, so where does all this war and fighting and quarreling come from? All right, well, James says it comes out of these sensual desires, your lusts. You, amen, let's, let's, read, let's read the text. You lust, he says, and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. Let's look at that on the Amplified side. You are jealous and covet what others have. Yeah. And your decision, or pardon me, your desires go unfulfilled, so you become murderers. Now, let me, let me elaborate on that for a second. You don't necessarily have to do physical bodily harm to take one's life to be a murderer from the perspective of the scripture. If you hate, if you're a hater of someone, uh oh, that makes you, according to the scripture, a murderer. Huh? Yeah, it's that deep. Now, you can challenge me on that if you want, and I'll tell you what, go ahead and Google it up. Google knows everything else. Just put it in there and it'll take you to the passage of Scripture that shows you that, man, when you hate one another, you are taking on or allowing and opening yourself up to the spirit of murder. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. I'm just teaching. Praise God. I'm going to read it again. You're jealous and covet what others have, and your desires go unfulfilled, so you become murderers. To hate is to murder. As far as your hearts are concerned, mm. you burn with envy and anger and are not able to obtain the gratification, the contentment, and the happiness that you seek. So you fight and war. You do not have because you do not 
ask. And I believe when I left off with that particular statement in the last segment, and I apologize in advance, we won't be able to get into the depth. Time won't allow me to get into the depth of the story, but I'm going to take you to 1 Kings chapter 21, where we will find the story of Naboth's vineyard. And I want to tell you, there was a murder that occurred there. Why? Because a king named Ahab, walking by, saw Naboth's vineyard. And it was like right next to the palace. And King Ahab said, Naboth, I love that vineyard you've got. I want you to give it to me, or I want you to sell it to me. I mean, you know, it, th the story has a lot of depth to it. We will learn a lot of things about ourselves and about others as we look at that story. We're going to look at the haves and the have-nots. I'm not talking about a television series now. I'm talking about a biblical account of what happened here between this man named Naboth and a man who was in great power named King Ahab, who was married, by the way, to a queen named Jezebel. Ooh, boy, I tell you what, if you, you think the soap operas have some stories, you, you're gonna, you will not want to miss the unfolding of this story, Naboth's Vineyard. But I don't mind letting you in on it, but here's the deal. The king wanted this vineyard, but Naboth refused to give it up. He, he even said, God forbid that I should sell this land to you that belongs to my ancestors, to my lineage. And that, that's got some deep roots to it. And, 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 and the king was upset because he offered him to pay for it, but, but Naboth refused to sell it. You see, Naboth was not like, who's, who am I thinking about? Esau, the twin to Jacob. Remember that story? Jacob and Esau. How did Esau had come in from hunting and he was famished and tired and exhausted and hungry and thirsty and everything. And his brother Jacob was there fixing some big stew. And, you know, Esau didn't have a good day hunting. He didn't get anything, so he didn't have any fresh game to dress and cook and boil or whatever, however they made it up. And he said, uh, brother, give me some of that porridge. And so, you know, Jacob said, well, you give me that birthright. And uh, Esau said, man, what good is a birthright going to do if I'm going to fall over dead from starvation and hunger and thirst? He said, birthright, schmirschright. Hey, you can have it, man. Just give me some of that stew. And so, you know, Jacob said, okay, it's a deal. A deal is a deal. And what I'm trying to tell you is that, see, Naboth, <laughs> Naboth was not like Esau. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not giving up this property to you, king. You know, I'm, I'm holding on to this. I'm not going to give it up to you. And see, the deal is Esau became indifferent. He traded the most for the least. And that's another story. As I said, we'll bore down into it, line upon line, precept upon precept. You're going to want to know this information. This can help you even in this season, even in times such as this in moving forward. So you don't want to miss that. So I want you to be prepared in our next segment uh, to turn to 1 Kings chapter 21. We will unfold to you by the help of the Holy Ghost, Naboth's vineyard, and all the principles that we can learn out of that. Now, since I've told you in advance, I hope you'll read the story. You'll be ready to go right on along with me because, again, I, I know the Holy Spirit. He's already be begun to deal with me extracting critically important principles out of it that can help us in our everyday lives. Praise God. Well, I'll tell you what, our time is basically gone now, but I trust that this, uh, this message has been a source of encouragement, blessing, inspiration, and practical instruction for everyday living to you. You know, there's nothing more important than your relationship with God. And then maybe I should ask the question, do you have one? Uh, or have you, through this COVID season, being shut in, being limited, being restricted, have you found other means and things that have uh, competed for your attention? Have you neglected your spiritual vital signs as prayer, study, meditation, reading of the word? You know, even though many of us cannot come in person in personal church services, and yet, thank God for technology, he has enabled us to be able to come live stream to you and to bring other events and things like that through technology. Uh, but, you know, you've got to even tune into that. You, you've, there's something on your part that you have to do to make that connection. And it needs to remain the top priority in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want you to make the mistake of thinking that because of a pandemic, that because of environmental challenges and hazards in the world right now, that that displaces our need for our relationship and fellowship with God, because it does not. In fact, it becomes very dangerous 
if you go lean on your fellowship and relationship with God versus, you know, messing around with the world and the central issues that are over there. It can be very, very dangerous and very, very costly to you. You don't want to compromise that relationship with God. Very, very important because he's the one that's going to, as I said earlier, protect, preserve, sustain, and keep you and uphold you with the right hand of his righteousness, even through this pandemic era, even, even through the election season and cycle here in November in the United States of America. I don't know what's going on in the other countries, but I know what's going on here, what's coming up. And I mean, we're going into full swing on that. Amen. And by the way, I might as well say it while I'm here, at least for all of our American citizens. I hope you're ready to exercise your, the great privilege we have to vote. Every vote counts, and you should vote, praise the Lord, come November, or however your means and method of voting, whether you're mailing in a ballot or whether you're going in person, whatever it is, you have every right to vote. If you're a voting age and you qualify, go cast that vote. Amen. Praise the Lord.